All in favor of Stephen being our permanent team building activity coordinator? Okay, I might need uh, I might need more help than I or uh, I need lots of help in lots of ways. But there, oh good, okay. Is that, yeah. So I first of all want to just acknowledge some people who are with us uh, today whose faces are new and who you may not have met yet that we should meet together. We have a couple that are with us who are still interviewing for positions at the school. So Lem Harsh, Lem raise your hand, okay, and Tyler Bell, Tyson, Tyson Bell, right here. And is Cynthia here? Okay. Uh, and Cynthia's last name is? Collier, excuse me. Uh, who else? Crystal Swayze was here yesterday. Okay. Um, and, and this is Mrs. Fletcher. Fletcher. Mrs. Fletcher, uh, parent at the school. And are you going to be helping us in one of our classes as well? Which one? What's that? It's up, it's up to us. Okay, terrific. Who else? shall we do an introduction of before we move on here? We're going to have, we're going to give them each some time. Uh, oh, yes, thank you. It's Jill Condor is going to be helping as an aide in fourth grade. We could do all of our needs. Should we just do all of the new hires while we're here? Okay, Kay Anderson, first grade. And, sure, please. Oh, I, yeah. We'll just kind of go from this side of the room to the next. Um, we've got Stacy Wood. Stacy will be our <laughs> guidance counselor. Her office will be where Leland is currently. Okay, let's see, scanning going this way. Jake, all red. Jake is doing <laughs> database manager, cross country, and Yearbook. All right. We introduce Tyson, Lem. Who else coming this way? Charlotte Bingham. Where's Charlotte? Right here. Charlotte Bingham will be in second grade. So notice if you probably saw this on the building map, we have four, three Binghams, three Binghams who are located within. Well, adjacent to each other, all adjacent to each other. Two Binghams in second grade and one in, in kindergarten, and two C Binghams. So we, it will be important to say Cynthia and Charlotte Bingham. Okay, welcome. We, oh, Lacey, Aston, in third grade. Welcome, Lacey. We did K. Mrs. Crockett, Mrs. Crockett is here as a parent, but also Mrs. Crockett is interested in potentially serving as an aide in a classroom, and so we know we have lots of needs there, and we'll be talking more about maybe which spot and when and how, and substitute teaching. And I bragged about you, I bragged about you and Josh yesterday in my opening devotional, so thank you. You did such a terrific job with our uh, graduation committee, and thank you for that. All right. Adam Hendrickson is not here, but he is, there's quite a few that aren't here right now, and we'll introduce them when they are so you can see their faces and put names on them. So we've been talking a lot about principles. Heather, thank you. I, Heather is one of those people that looks so familiar to me. Heather Peterson was a student here, an alumna. She's going to be serving as a teacher's aide. Welcome. In which class, Heather? Third grade. Third grade. Heather Peterson. Anyone else? She just did, yeah. Keisha will be teaching fifth grade, that's right. Very excited about that. Okay, everyone give all of our new people a big round of applause. I promise there will be more introductions. As we grow, introducing gets tricky because we don't want to leave anyone out. So we've been talking about principles. We've been talking about best practices. Yesterday, I mean, the seven principles, and today, Arbinger, and all these relationship techniques. And we do this during foundations training, and we do this during other trainings in our life. I mean, you can go down the list, state conferences, and you know, our sacrament meetings, and Wood Badge, and Young Women's Camp, and we go through all of this value training. 
And then we get back to the trenches, and something happens. It's, it's like our muscle memory just kicks in, and we go right back to what we were doing before. And then we start to experience a range of emotions about that. Guilt. Am, am I the only one who's having a hard time implementing these seven principles and these eight virtues and these four characteristics and the lists of lists, right? It's been said sometimes that one of the greatest enemies of real change is trying to change all the things you know you should change. Pick one. Part of the reason that our muscle memory kicks in is related to this notion of implicit bias, which is part of our brain's muscle memory. It's our conditioning. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that. This is a book called Blind Spot: The Hidden Biases of Good People. On the back of the piece of paper that I gave you, on, on, on the front you have this C to C, and we'll get to those questions in just a minute. Turn over on the back, there is a grid that looks like, well, I think I have the grid. Here's some more. If you don't have this grid right here, I want you to just here, pass these around. Take a look at this grid. I want you to cover one eye. Doesn't matter which one, cover one eye and slowly bring that grid towards you, focusing on the middle with your one open eye, okay? And stop about six inches, it'll be somewhere between six and ten inches from your face, where the other dot vanishes. Okay? It, it'll be a little bit different for each person, but cover one eye. You need to cover one eye or this isn't going to work. You've got to cover one eye and focus on the center the cross in the center with your one open eye, and then bring the sheet close to your face until one of the dots disappears. Hold it, hold it in landscape portrait, or landscape format. Okay, you can work on this, you can work on this a little bit later. Um, this, is a, this is a physiological fact. It has to do with the curvature of your eye and the way that light is processed by your brain, one of the dots will disappear completely. But so, so raise your hand if that actually happened to you, if you saw it happen, one of the dots disappeared. Okay, it's called a blind spot, it's a real thing, it's not, it's not just psychology, it's biology. And there's another interesting thing that happens though that is psychological, it's not biological. Did you notice and try this again. Did you notice what your brain puts there in place of the dark spot that disappeared? David, what? You, your brain actually fills in the grid. That is not biology. That is psychology. We see things that are not there, literally. I'm going to show you some more about our blind spots. We all have them. In fact, when I mentioned this to Ed this morning and said, we're going to be talking about implicit bias, I said, do you know what that is? And he said, yes, I know what that is. That's what we think everyone else has. <laughs> he was exactly right. But this is from one of our hymns, and we're going to come back to this at the very end. Which hymn is this from, music people, or anyone who loves sacred hymns? The Lord is my light, Ty. That's exactly where it's from. There is no darkness in his sight at all. He is, he is the one that will help us to see our blind spots. But we also need each other to see our blind spots. Leadership and self-deception and the choice. By the way, the choice, if you wonder what the choice is, and I thought it was very timely that President uh, Monson talked about choices in his very brief but powerful sermon, which of course at any day could be his last sermon. He's mostly in a wheelchair now. He doesn't like to be seen in his wheelchair. And so he has people help him to the podium and can't stay at the podium for very long. But he's mostly in a wheelchair right now. His sermon most recently was on choice. So what is 
the choice, according to Arbinger. Well, basically, the choice is to honor the spirit, in which case you have a heart at peace, or to betray the spirit, in which case you start to have a heart at war. And so if you listen to Terry Warner and all of the work that goes into and, and this whole consulting business about you know, the anatomy of peace and leadership and self-deception, they're really trying to teach people to listen to the spirit. That's the choice. Listen to it or not. And there's really only two choices in life according to 2 Nephi, right? Liberty or captivity. And we choose that every minute, every hour, every day. Here are some of the things that cause us. So these are some of the indicators that help us to know whether we're in the box or out of the box. We know when we're in the box when we're experiencing some of these emotions. And we know when we're getting free of the box when we have those much lighter emotions, emotions full of light. And there are some of them again, the differences when we are honoring the spirit and making the choice to honor it versus betraying the spirit. Okay, we spent lots of time on this, you know, a year ago in service and you've done it this morning. I want to move on because, again, with our rational mind, with our rational mind, we know we need to make the right choice. Why is it when we get in the trenches, we betray that choice? How is it that we can overcome our blind spots? So, which table is longer? The one on the left? It's what you're supposed to say. Your rational mind is kicking in right now. Do you, do you actually see, do you see something else? It looks longer on the left. And of course, the answer, your rational minds know, the answer is that it is exactly the same parallelogram that goes and fits on both of these. But why is it? that even when we know rationally the right answer, the power of this illusion cannot be overcome by most of our thinking or reasoning brains, our prefrontal cortex. Our limbic system, by the way, is the thing that's telling us right now, our emotional system, that these tables are different sizes. These tables are exactly the same size. What is it, art, art teachers, what is it about this diagram that causes us to think that one is longer? Perspective, and specifically, it's the, it's the legs. The legs beneath the tabletops are drawn in such a way that on the left, we perceive depth. And we perceive that parallelogram to be going back into a three-dimensional space. We have been conditioned from the time we were born to see images in three dimensions. And so two-dimensional parallelograms that are drawn with three dimensions can really deceive our brain. And what our brain does is it fills in the blanks. It says, oh, because of that short leg, it must be a longer parallelogram. But it's not. They're the same size. Jan. Quickly, I always say to my students a lot, I said, you have to actually draw what you see. And it's not just the picture. Mm -hmm. It's the picture. Yeah, and, and an art teacher understands what that means. You're getting at the difference between what we see and feel versus what a ruler might say. Okay. How about this one? Surely you can see that the shades of gray in squares A and B are identical. Now A is right there and B is right there. Can you see that those shades are identical? They are identical. How about now? Now can you see that the shades of A and B are identical? How about now? Now can you see that the shades of A and B are identical? Whoops. What's going on here? It's the, it's the same concept. It's, it's an art concept with, again, our conditioned brain that compensates for shadow. Excuse me. We have learned, we have, our, our mind has learned to perceive shadow. And so when we see something in a shadow, our mind actually 
looks at the shadow and discounts the darkness so that we know that a color is about the same whether it's in shadow or not. We can perceive white in a shadow or in light. And that's what's happening here. Your brain sees this cylinder, knows it's casting a shadow, and says, oh, that, that space B must be much lighter than it actually is. Okay? All right. What we are really talking about here is when we talk about bias and, all, and, impli and implicit bias, which is different than explicit bias, what we are talking about is the duality of our nature. And there's plenty in the scriptures to show us that we live in a fallen mortality where this is part of our test. We were hardwired to have a dual nature, to perceive things and feel so strongly about them, to categorize things that could be seen very differently by other people. And it's based in large part upon our conditioning, our experiences. And we're living with people who have had very different conditioning, very different experiences, and they see these things very differently. And the question is, what is truth? What, what, what is the truth? Is that, are A and B really the same shade? Or aren't they? And if you want to talk about what matters most, facts versus feelings, Elder Oaks said sometimes it's feelings. Actually, he said in his lessons learned, feelings mostly matter more than facts. Because we're talking about people in a fallen world who are perceiving things and feeling things about their perspective. Here's another one. How often do we feel like, based upon our own educational experience, based upon what we know, based upon what we have been conditioned to believe, we are learning. And our position must therefore be the right one. OK. So the book Blind Spot spends a lot of time focusing on implicit bias. And there is a team of researchers, psychologists, who have been doing a test on human implicit bias for about 20 years now. And implicit bias is bias that, that comes about as a result of the automaticity of our brain. I showed you a few examples of automatic bias. You don't even think about it. You just assume. Well, it's fine when you're talking about tabletops and parallelograms and cylinders and shadows or a blind spot that's a graph and you're covering your eye and who cares if, if someone is biased and sees something that's not there or assumes something that isn't there. But what about if you're talking about far more sensitive subjects like race, gender, human sexuality, things that people view as part of their core identity, and you're making judgments about that, and I'm making judgments about that based upon implicit bias. That gets pretty sensitive. So, Project Implicit, this Harvard group of psychologists, put together a test that tries to compensate for the defects that most psychological research has suffered from for centuries. Psychology and sociology gather most of their data and most of their information from two primary methods. They draw conclusions from two primary methods. One is surveys, asking questions of people and letting people respond. And number two is observation. Observation and survey, observation and survey. You ask them questions and then you test the veracity and the truthfulness of the answers with observations and you try to put those two things together and, and decide what's going on in the unconscious brain. What's the problem with surveys? You tell me. Oral, written, you, it doesn't matter. What's the problem, Mrs. Reed? 
The socially responsible answers. Okay, what are the other problems with, with surveys? Okay, just the level of investment in surveys. You know, do you get, do you get a, 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 a statistically representative sample because of, you know, the, hum, the humanness of wanting to be a part of it or not? Okay, good. The question itself could could have a bias. So so this is called this is called misinformation in the psychology world that that there is in, that there are inferences made by the very questions that cause us to have implicit bias. How many of you have been involved in a car accident before? And then the police come along and they start asking you questions about the accident. And you start answering right there on the spot and you're thinking, now let's see, was that light, was it yellow? Or, I think it was yellow, maybe it was red. How about a week later when someone asks you about the accident? How about six months later when it's in court and you're asking witnesses or even people who are part of it? There, is, there are inferences and misinformation, that, and there are, there are teams of people that try to make sure that witnesses in jury trials are cross-examined for implicit bias and for misinformation and for inferences. So for example, if a question is asked of a witness who, who was there, present, watching the accident happen, if the question is asked this way, did you see car A as it bumped into car B? If, it's, if the question is asked that way versus, did you see car A as it smashed into car B? And you do a survey of, and then the follow-up question is, how fast was car A going when it bumped into car B versus how fast was car A going when it smashed into car B? Which one do you think will have a higher miles per hour response to that second question? Smashed. It's an inference in the question that causes misinformation in your recollection. Again, implicit bias, right? We're conditioned to respond to certain things. Okay, how about the failures of observations? We just talked about surveys. Failures of observations? Why is that? What are the defects of observing and, and coming to conclusions based upon your observations? Mrs. Reed? You come with your own biases, you got your own glasses on, Chase. There is a confirming bias. I have a certain opinion, and I'm going to look for evidence in my observations that confirms what I already think. OK? There's the fill-in um, problem, right? When there's, a, when there's a question, and I don't know the answer because it's blind to me, I'm just going to put something there because it's more comfortable for me to feel like there's an answer than for me to admit I don't know. Admitting that we don't know is scary. And it's one of the real problems when you get to these sensitive topics about things like race and gender and roles that we play in the home, that we want to pretend to know the answers to a lot of those questions, because pretending to know is a lot easier than admitting we don't. Is there another hand here? Okay, so back to, exactly, exactly. So I think we agree that there are some real deficiencies in the way that most research has been done on, on implicit bias and subconscious or unconscious bias. It's bias that we're not even aware that we have. So what did this Harvard team do, coming back to them? We've got, they said, we've got to solve for this problem. So they, they started looking at ways that would test our implicit conditioned feelings about a question without having to actually go through the process of letting someone reflect about it and answer a question or just observing them. And what they created was this test called the implicit bias test. And it flashes, it flashes a, a series of pictures 
such as a series of insects in front of the, the subject. And then it flashes another series of pictures, such as flowers. And you're supposed to categorize all the insects that you see and all the flowers that you see as quickly as you can. You're not going to think about it now. It's not your reasoning brain. You're not reflecting about it. You are responding. This is an automaticity test. So you have two buttons on your computer. And you can do this. You can get on and see. There are millions of samples that have been collected at Project Implicit at Harvard to try to create this very significant test sample, which, by the way, it, the correlation coefficient for this in testing bias is very high if you're a statistics you know, person. So it, it, with millions of samples and seeing how it connects to actual observed bias, it's a very high correlation. What you do is you get in front of a computer, and when you see the insect, you push, you push for example, the left arrow. And when you see a butterfly, you push, or uh, um, yeah, flower, thank you, you push the right arrow, and you're categorizing things. Okay, Remember that bias is all about what the brain does to categorize. And categorization is an important survival and thriving technique that human beings need to use, right? We do it all the time. We categorize. Left for insects, right for flowers. And that's really easy, and people can do it really fast. And then it gives you a picture of the insects, and it gives you some words like scary, furry, um, anxious, anxiety, some negative words. And you're supposed to put insect to the left and the words to the right. That's really easy. And then it gives you pictures of flowers and gives you positive characteristics like fragrant. And you can categorize those really easy. And then it gives you a mixed up um, palette of pictures of insects or flowers. And it gives you all the positive words only. And it says, OK, we want you to categorize all the flowers. And you're going to have some negative words there. And most people have a really hard time quickly categorizing the flower to the left and the negative word to the right because they don't associate flowers with negative words like scary or, or anxiety. Your, your automatic brain doesn't sort. They don't make that association. Same thing with insects and the lovely words like fragrant and beautiful. But if you're an entomologist, that categorization is easy. You can sort insects and positive words really easily because that's how you associate insects. OK, flowers and, and insects, that's, again, a harmless example. It's a little bit like the, the, the ones we showed you here. But what about when you're asked to sort black faces or African American faces and white faces or European American faces, and you're going to sort positive and negative associations? What does your brain do now? And if you're asked before you take the test, are you someone who is biased against African Americans? What do most people say? No, I'm not biased. I love African Americans. In fact, my mother is African American. And then you take the automaticity test, the implicit test, and you sort this, and you find out that, in fact, you or I have unconscious bias against African Americans. You have a really hard time sorting the African-American face and the positive characteristics. It takes longer. So this test is timing how long it takes you, how many you get correct. I can't believe it. In fact, one of the most notorious tests was a famous gay rights activist who, you know, about five years ago said, I have no bias against people based upon their sexual preference or orientation. I respect people who are same-sex attracted as much as people who are heterosexually attracted. And really made a big deal about this. And he said, I'll take any test you want me to take. Went in, took the test, found out through this test 
that he was, in fact, strongly associated negatively against same-sex attracted people. He was disturbed at this. He felt very strongly that the test was flawed. It was the test that was wrong, not him. And this is the feeling that we get sometimes when we are confronted with our own blind spots. We want to resist that. All right, um, there are four categories of bias. I think you get the sense that what we're talking about here is not just someone's opinion about the way we process information and, you know, we, we, we spent a lot of time this week talking about values and principles, but again, why is it that when push comes to shove, we go right back to doing some of these things, making some of these choices, treating people in ways that seem more animal than human, in part because of our conditioning. There's automatic responses that trigger when someone treats us unkindly, or when a student disobeys, or when a student has a certain kind of countenance, even. We've been conditioned to respond in a certain way to that face. I will, send all, I, I will send this to you so you, can, so you can have it. I really wanted you to just focus on two pieces of paper because we can get lost in all the paper that we have. And, um, but I will send these afterwards. Yes? So it's just like the letter of the law that our attack is implicit bias. Oh, you were invited to do the implicit bias test. And there are, there are about 150 categories, right? It, um, you, you, you can test yourself for lots of different kinds of bias. So there are at least four categories, at least researchers refer to four major categories of bias. And here's the definition of bias. Bias itself is not good or bad, it's natural. There is explicit personal bias, which is bias that we admit that we have and we, we can show people that we have it. I have a bias in favor of green. I love that color. It's obvious because I like to choose green and some of the things that I, okay, that's an explicit bias. Implicit bias is bias that we're not sure that we have. Oftentimes we don't know that we have it. It's a blind spot. It's also referred sometimes as the bias that we're not willing to talk about because sometimes we don't, we don't know that it's there. Explicit institutional bias are things like policies. You can see that an institution has a certain bias in favor of certain values because it has a policy about it. Implicit institutional bias are the kinds of biases that we do as groups or families or communities that we may not realize that we're doing, but we are, or that we're feeling that way. Okay, it's late in the day and we need to move a little bit. So what I want you to do is I want you to get, yes, do we have any other questions about yeah. bias? Quick question, you might call that Sure. Sure, you bet. Traditions are a major part of conditioning that leads to the associations for bias. By the way, if you want to know what one of the most ubiquitous biases is and that has the largest, the largest, um, what do they call this? Dissonance. The largest dis cognitive dissonance is where you say one thing with your rational brain, but you actually feel a different way. The bias that has the largest cognitive dissonance in all cultures across all age groups, can you guess what it is? Vegetable, Vegetable bias. <laughs> Actually, you're not too far off, Jared. If you were talking about vegetables as being age bias, then you're right. It's age. Ageism is the thing that when asked to respond rationally, do you, do you love people who are elderly? What do we say? Of course we do. do you, they're my grandpa and my grandma, and they're, this white silvery hair is just beautiful. But implicitly, people have some of the strongest, ubiquitously you know, negative associations for aging of all the categories. Why is that? None of us want to get old. We start, you know, 
And this is a very stressful thing for all of us. And yet we continue to say that we love age. It's experience. It's wisdom. And all of those things are true. And isn't it interesting that, that even the elderly, when asked to take the implicit bias test, they of all people should say that they love being old. And they do. They do say, I love being old. I'm retired. You know, I don't have as many responsibilities. I don't have to take care of the children, their grandchildren, all these answers. And yet they themselves are some of the most strongly negatively associated biased against elderly um, of all the populations that are, that are tested. OK. I want you to break up into groups of four. Four or five. I don't want them any larger than five. And I would like for you to talk through, I would like for you to talk through some of these big questions. C to C. Commitment to care. These questions are all related about are all related to the culture of care at American Heritage School. And I want you to talk through these questions, come up so, with some answers, and then we will get some collective thinking from the group on these questions, OK? Go ahead. OK. Let's circle back as a big group. And by the way, um, we're going to finish here in seven minutes, seven or eight minutes. If you haven't taken a chance yet to start filling out your evaluation for day two, please start filling that out, even as I ask some of these questions to get feedback from your small groups, OK? So that when you're walking out, you're done for the day. OK, what's the difference between bias and prejudice, categorization and stereotyping? What do you think? Julie? And we may not even endorse our biases, right? We may say when we take the, the implicit project implicit test, we may say, OK, I can see that I am. By the way, it ranks you moderately, strongly, I mean, it, it, weakly. But we may not endorse those biases, even though they exist, OK? Categorization and stereotyping, sort of the same thing. Any other comments on that question? What at AHS conveys explicit institutional bias? Mission statement? Honor code? Clearly, in the honor code, there are some things. Our dress code? The words on the building? OK. The seven principles. Is there anything at AHS that conveys implicit institutional bias. This is a little bit harder because implicit means we don't talk about it much. It just tends to be a feeling out there. We're not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> and I'm giving you permission right now to talk about it. <laughs> Heather, you are a student. Right. Uh, before I was a student, I was on the Asian Family Reaction Committee. I was there talking about and everyone was like, oh, this is how every grad school. Interesting. The and the board talks about that one a lot. It's not explicit. The board talks about how do we, as we grow, as the school becomes a higher performing institution that more people want, as, as, you know, as, we, as tuition goes up a little bit, do we have an elitist association with the community? Is that an implicit kind of bias? And are we prejudiced in any way to people who may not be able to afford the tuition here? Very good. David? Uh, my bias is when I was grade four, I was 80% prejudice. Ah, the core versus specialty, implicit, potentially this implicit culture of, of, of this class is more important than that one. OK, very good. Well, it doesn't mean I wouldn't say, well, that's core, but that's more important. Yeah, we're just the offset. OK, good. Mr. Hunsaker and assistant principals, will you please write some of these down? <laughs> what else? Implicit institutional bias. Good. Good. Maybe, maybe to Heather's point that that we may have we may have this bias of of breathing our own fumes and.
and how is it that we get out of the bottle and view it from the outside, okay? That we have a corner on truth. Okay? Good. See, confronting our biases is not a comfortable experience, but it's so important. If we're really going to be learners, is that a hand? Good question. We could, we could spend even more time saying, what are the indicators or the evidences that might cause people to perceive us as or cause us to feel these implicit biases? OK, David? Some political bias? Sure. There's no question that this is a conservatively biased or organization, right? Now. Let's move on because we need to get to some of the value questions. Um, I think we'll skip, well, let's not skip. Number four, can we just call some out? We, we actually, you sort of answered number four, some of you, with the perception of American heritage. Um, and these are some of the negative association biases. There are also positive association biases, right? There, sure, sure. There, there are some examples in our athletic history of teams who have really felt like they didn't live up to that Christian, Christian mission statement. Does, and does that bother anyone that we are expected to live up to a Christian mission statement versus everyone else's mission statement? It shouldn't. You know, we have a challenge to rise to. Okay. Again, a dissonance, right, maybe? OK, is AHS a safe or welcoming place for students with different characteristics, question mark, values, and should it be a place like that? Lorita? OK. Karen, then Julie? Please. That he did not feel welcome. Who had a liberal political leaning philosophy. Which is in contrast to the implicit institutional bias, which then okay. made him feel extremely uncomfortable. Okay, good. I wouldn't say that's a good thing, but that's a very helpful comment. Well, Julie? Thank you. Again, being confronted with some of our own blind spots is a soul searching exercise. Yes, go ahead. And what's the difference between a Ramiumptum and a city on the hill? They both have to be in high places, right? What's the difference? It's what's in the heart of those two, are we doing what we're doing in order to be seen, to get accolades, to be in the press, to get money, to, or are we doing this because we really believe that this is something that will change and save lives? That's the difference between a Rami Umptum and a city on the hill. Thank you. Jake? And this is the question that I asked here of should we be a place that is safe and welcoming to all characteristics and values? We've got to think deeply about this question. Characteristics, values, are we going to apologize for the rock of principle that we currently stand on? Does that mean that we will therefore 
be unwelcoming to those who want to come and be a part of who we are, even if they have different characteristics. These are nuanced questions. We're not going to answer them in three minutes. This is a conversation. These really are questions. I don't have all the answers. I'm going to be the chief learner here. And we need all of our help on these questions. Very good. Okay, question number six. Boundaries of identity, orientation, attraction, expression, within which students may safely operate and, and employees. Yes, oh, Laura. that next question. Mm -hmm. It is yes and yes, both of those things, right? So uh, Mrs. Pat, yeah, go, go ahead, why don't you just repeat it for her, you can project. Another way to put that is, is American heritage a safe place for someone who is questioning a certain value that we have already adopted? So um, is American heritage a safe place for someone to question values? And Karen says, no, it's not a safe place for someone to question values because it's Act Beach. Other responses to that question? It certainly could be. I, I can see lots of connections here, right? Okay, Bethany? This is a question that raises more questions for you than, it, than you know, maybe you found answers for in your groups, right? And, and okay, we'll take one more then. I've got to wrap up because I want to let you out 15 minutes early. So, and, this go, and this goes to the notion that one of the best things about American heritage is that it's small, and one of the worst things about American heritage is that it's small, right? right? Okay. All right. Well, um, go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. When we do family interviews for new parents and new families, and you, they ask the question, how do you feel about our family who don't want to pledge allegiance to the flag? Then we look at them and say, are they mission fit for what we're doing? OK. So um, I want to conclude by just inviting us all, as is one of the key takeaways in leadership and self-deception, self I would like for us all to recognize, and I think we have by voting with our feet, that American heritage is a wonderful place to be, a teacher and a learner. I think the very nature of these questions cause us to consider the parade of horribles, 
where a school adopts an egalitarian approach, that every value is equally valuable. Can that possibly be logically true? That every value is equally valuable? Is murder just as valuable as life? So I think we, I think we reason through this with our minds that, that no, every value can't be equally valuable. And yet, what are we doing to make sure that we're addressing some of these complicated questions where we don't know the answer exactly to how we create a safe environment for students who are questioning values. I hope our students are questioning values. If they're not questioning values, I'm not sure they're learning. And I pray for more students like Zach Veach because he gets us to, to consider some things that may be sort of breathing our own fumes. Do I pray for a student who will come and, and and cross the honor code boundary, break the honor code? No. That's expression that goes too far. Breaking, so another way to put this is the counsel we receive from living prophets is that we ought to be truth seekers, but don't break covenants while you're seeking truth. That shuts down the whole process. So how do we feel about people who are questioning values? Is there a place for them? Or do we sort of put them in a category, an implicit bias category as being a bad student or a bad employee because they're questioning certain processes or methodologies or it's a question. And I think we would, we're gonna become stronger as an organization as we continue this conversation. And it does have to do with relationships. These feelings that we have matter more than facts. And it is about repentance. I mean, Ed's comment today about this sister missionary who needed to repent. That's because I asked you a lot of questions. <laughs> I was mentioning this to Grant today. It's, it's all about changing, right? but aligning ourselves with the way the Lord sees things and with his desires and so forth. Uh, but um, that is something that we don't really talk about very much. Right? We point to someone and say, this is a man of great faith, or a woman of great faith, right? But have you ever heard anyone stand up and say, what a great repentance. Or that 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 guy really knows how to repent. <laughs> and I used to say to our missionaries all the time, and I say to my kids, that's you know that's what I want on my tombstone. Here lies a great repentant. Here's somebody that is willing to to, to to change in the right way for the right reasons. And I think part of this process is, is doing that. Um, I think that that's the only that's the only way that we really can align ourselves the right way. And it's harder as the questions become harder, but it's, it's possible. Well, thank you. I appreciate your giving this question some thought. We'll, we'll have some more on this later as we go down this journey and this path together. You are wonderful, and I would, I would not want to be a part of any other school culture or team than with you. I, I get out of bed every morning exciting excited to come because of you. We've got great curriculum, we've got a great building, we've got lots of great things here, but it would be nothing if it weren't for you. So thank you. Thank you for the sacrifice of time, especially during the summer when you could be doing so many other things. We trust that these principles, even if there's one of them that is incorporated, inculcated, and planted, we trust that these principles will make a big difference in the lives of ourselves and our students. Thank you. Let's have a closing prayer. We'll let you go home a little bit early. Uh, Corinne, would you be willing to offer that for us? Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this beautiful day. We're grateful to be here together and to share our thoughts and our feelings and our testimonies of thy gospel and the truth that we are seeking. 
we're grateful for the principles that keep us anchored to thee. We're grateful for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that he is the one source, the truth, the light, the way to help us back to thee. We are grateful for continued revelation.